Good morning. We are now, uh, this is a combination of the Senate Judiciary Committee and the Senate Agriculture Committee. We're taking up S-268, the right to farm bill. Did somebody say something? Senator Starr is the chair yeah. of the Senate Agriculture Committee, and we will be co-hosting this event. So we're going to start off with Michael O'Grady, who's the legislative counsel, to give us a brief walkthrough of the bill. The firemen. Uh, Meg Nelson, if you would, thank you very much. Uh, uh, go ahead. Good morning, uh, committees. My name is Michael O'Grady. I'm with the Office of Legislative Counsel. With Senator Parent's approval, can I give a little background to how the this bill originated? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there has been, um, I think, as many of you know, mm -hmm. ongoing litigation uh, regarding um, nuisance for a farm uh, in Addison County that inspired a lot of questions mm -hmm. from the farming community about the state's right to farm law and how it compares to other state right to farm laws. Senator Parent was interested in that discussion and uh, engaged with me in um, looking at uh, ways to strengthen the state's right to farm law. In uh, drafting and researching and drafting the bill, uh, I had our paralegal, Jesse Tracy, um, pull down the right to farm laws from uh, 28 states. Uh, and we did a, a review of those laws. Um, and basically, there's a whole spectrum of right to farm laws across the country. Um, you can characterize some as being very, very, very protective such as Oregon, which does not allow nuisance or trespass um, claims um, unless basically there's, there's death or serious injury as a result. Um, and then there's Vermont, which is basically on the other end of the spectrum, which uh, allows a rebuttable presumption if certain conditions are met, but that rebuttable presumption can be overcome if certain standards are met. And then there's a lot in between. So what I did is I worked with Senator Parent, um, mainly using the right to farm laws from Michigan and Arkansas, but those laws are also duplicated um, or provisions of those laws are duplicated throughout many other states, right to farm laws. So what this bill is intended to do is to strengthen the Vermont right to farm law based on existing right to farm statutes in other states, but doesn't go as far as um, right to farm protection could go as evidenced by Oregon and some other states. So with that as background, um, I'll just start walking through the bill if, uh, if you would like me to, and I will share my screen if you would like me to. Yep. Uh, before you do that, I just want to suggest the witnesses, they keep their remarks to five to 10 minutes um, because we are jam-packed and I'd like to hear from everybody if possible. Uh, um, it's important we hear from you, um, but uh, if we can be brief, we'll get through this day without um, problems. So, thank you, Mike. If you want to briefly sure. walk us through the bill. Okay, I'm going to share my screen, if that's okay. Yep. <clears throat> so can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yep. So the first section um, is amending the chapter in Title 12, um, which is uh, the chapter regarding court procedure or the title regarding court procedure um, in the chapter related to nuisance suits against existing laws, agriculture activities, but the um, term will be changed to farm operations. Um, so in the legislative findings, agricultural activities is changed to farm operations. I think the, the key 
finding, which would remain the same or relatively the same, um, begins at the bottom of page one. Uh, the General Assembly finds that farm operations are potentially subject to lawsuits based on the theory of nuisance, and these suits encourage and could force premature removal of farmland from agricultural use. That's the purpose of this chapter to protect farm operations from nuisance lawsuits. Then there's the definition section. Uh, the term agricultural activity remains, but it is expanded to include farming. As farming is defined under Act 250, the Act 250 definition of farming is also the definition of farming under the required agricultural practices. So it is effectively the default definition of farming in state statute. There's also a definition of farm, which is fairly intuitive. The land, plants, animals, buildings, or structures on a parcel of land used for farming. And then farm operations. So the protections for nuisance suits under S-268 will move from agricultural activities to farm operations. Agricultural activities are now going to be incorporated under what a farm operation does, but the actual protection is being extended to the farm operation. And the farm operation means the operation and management of a farm or a condition or activity that occurs at any time as necessary on a farm, including all those activities defined as agricultural activities and all of the following. Marketing produce at roadside stands, the generation of noise, odors, dust, fumes, and other associated conditions, composting, ditching and subsurface drainage of farm fields and the construction of farm ponds, handling of livestock waste and byproducts, operation of machinery and equipment necessary for a farm, including irrigation and drainage systems, the movement of vehicles, the field preparation and ground and aerial seeding and spraying, the on-site storage and application of agricultural inputs, the use of alternative pest management, management storage, transportation utilization, and application of farm byproducts, including manure, and the conversion from one farm operation to another farm operation, and the employment and use of labor. So that is what is going to be protected, those activities. Um, then we can skip over farm product and livestock and go right to 5753, which is where the protection from nuisance lawsuits is provided. You'll see that the title is changed to reflect the change from agricultural activities to farm operations. Then you'll see the existing law. Why don't we walk through this? Because you'll probably hear testimony about this. Agricultural activities under existing law shall be entitled to a rebuttable presumption that the activity does not constitute a nuisance if the agricultural activity meets all of the following conditions. It is conducted in conformity with federal, state, and local laws, including the required agricultural practices. It is consistent with good agricultural practices. It is established prior to surrounding non-agricultural activities, and it has not significantly changed since the commencement of prior surrounding non-agricultural activity. So that is how you qualify for the rebuttable presumption that a farm activity or an agricultural activity is not a nuisance. But that presumption can be rebutted and it's rebutted on, on um, page six, line eight. It does not constitute a, a nuisance by a showing that the activity has a substantial adverse effect on health, safety, or welfare, or has a noxious and significant an interference with the use and enjoyment of the neighboring property. So around the country in the 28 states that, that we looked at um, in researching the draft of the bill, there are a couple of states that have this, this standard, this ability to rebut the presumption or a presumption, um, basically. Um, but Vermont is probably the, the most lenient um, in an application of the presumption. Then you go on to what the new language would be. A farm or farm operation shall not be found to be a public or private nuisance under one or more of the following. The farm uh, or farm operation existed before a change in land use or occupancy of land and proximity to the farm. And if before that change in land use or occupancy of the farm, the farm or fa farm operation would not have been a nuisance. Then you get to the farm operation or farm 
alleged to be a nuisance is in good standing with the Secretary of Agriculture under 6 VSA Chapter 215. 6 VSA Chapter 215 is the agricultural water quality standards um, that the agency issues. It's, it's where the required agricultural practices originate from. It's where the medium farm operation permit is. It's where the large farm operation permit, it's where the small farm certification is. Now, some people might say that this is, this is too lenient, but this is actually based on an Iowa standard, uh, which says that a farm is, um, has an absolute defense to a nuisance or trespass claim if they comply with the required agri or the, the agricultural practices set by the agency in Iowa. So this is, this is, this is not exactly the same as Iowa, but it's based on Iowa and it's a standard used in other states. And then third, the farm or farm operation has been conducting the agricultural activity at issue for two or more years prior to the date a nuisance action is commenced determining the duration of an agricultural activity on a farm or farm operation. The initial date of operation shall be when the agricultural activity commenced on the farm or farm operation. And then you'll get to a separate subsection where nuisance protection is extended. And it's when a farm or farm operation that is conforming with state and federal law, they shall not be found to be a public or private nuisance as a result of any of the following. The change in ownership, of poor size, temporary cessation or interruption of farming, enrollment in governmental programs, adoption of new technology, or a change in the type uh, of farm product being produced. Now, this is a provision that is included in many right to farm laws across the country, Michigan, Arkansas, Colorado, I could go on. So th this is this is a fairly standard provision and right to farm laws across the country. And moving out of the section regarding protection of, of farm operation from nuisance suits, there is um, 5754A and any nuisance suit brought in which a farm or farm operation is alleged to be a nuisance. If the defendant farm or farm operation prevails, the court shall require the plaintiff to pay the actual amount of costs and expenses determined by the court to have been reasonably incurred by the farm or farm operation in connection with the defense of the action, including attorney's fees. Um, you know, attorney's fees are, are not popular. Attorney's fees provisions are not popular among your committees, um, but you have provided for these in the past. Um, and this is a uh, fairly common, it's not, it's not in every state right to farm law, but it is fairly common in state right to farm laws. And then well, last, the, pardon me? I guess that my biggest question is I'm trying to find the definition of nuisance. <laughs> that, that's, that's a great, great point, Senator Sears. Um, it's, it's, there isn't a, a definition of nuisance in this chapter. Um, and I don't think there's a great definition of nuisance in the statutes in general, um, but that, that it's a common law cause of action um, when the use and enjoyment of a person's property is being affected or impaired by an activity on a neighboring property or not necessarily neighboring, but, but uh, a but. property in close location. I mean, describing something as a nuisance suit to me is, and then me having all this language about nuisance suits without a definition is troubling to me. Because I don't know what, what's the difference. What's a nuisance to me may be a, a complete catastrophe to somebody else. Well, that, that's, that's, that's a great point. There's what's called private nuisance versus public nuisance. A private nuisance, it's, it's going to impair the private individual's use and enjoyment of their property. And there's a standard for that uh, in the common law. Uh, and the public nuisance is when it's going to affect the use and enjoyment or the public health uh, in general. Um, but I, I, can, I, can, I think that's a fair question. Um, Senator Sears and I can I can look into that uh, to provide you a standard. Again, I don't think there's a great definition in statute, but I can go uh, to 
to do some research from Vermont Supreme Court and get some precedent for you. Several years ago, as a result of an Addison County uh, situation with an apple orchard, I believe, we did the uh, coming to the nuisance standard. And so if you were there before the nuisance, I don't know that we ever defined nuisance there, but I, I do remember that, le that legislation. It was an important piece of legislation um, to protect the farmer. In this case, the neighbors were complaining about trucks operating at 4 a.m. with refrigerated trucks making quite a bit of noise. And um, then we had the ridiculous situation on the shooting range in Richmond where the people had bought the property from the shooting range and then complained about the noise from the shooting range. Right. Um, so right. those types of, I understand those types of suits, but this is, I, I just, uh, I think I need more information. So I'm glad that we've got such a lineup of witnesses. My problem is I can't print out the, wit, the changed witness list that Peggy sent me because it's in Word and I can't get my iPad to do it. So I'm gonna keep going to the iPad to see, but are there any other questions of Michael O'Grady? Could, could, could I just make some two follow-up points based on, yeah. on what you said about, about the apple? The, the apple orchard was trickets versus versus ox. And the, the court at that point said the right to farm law did not apply. And that's when the General Assembly amended the right to farm law to, um, to basically its current form. But while you were doing that, the, uh, the Iowa Supreme Court said Iowa's um, right to farm law uh, constituted a taking of... I don't know, uh, somebody's talking. They're going over the bill. James isn't there yet. Um, yeah, whoever teased, I think that's T's phone. Who? Um, you're on the phone, T's iPhone. You can press star six to mute yourself, please. And if you could identify yourself, because we don't know your name. So, and in in any event, the when Iowa Supreme Court said that that the, their right to farm law could affect taking, it, Sam Burr was the drafter at the time, and he worked with your committees to to come up with the the existing Vermont right to farm law, and it was it was drafted in a way to avoid um, those claims of takings if they would occur, but. As right to farm laws have evolved around the country, including in Iowa, they have become much stronger and much more protective of the farm operation than, than existing Vermont right to farm law is. And I also want to note that the right to farm law is not a shield to litigation. So, you know, farmers that I've talked to this, this season are, are surprised that anyone can even bring litigation against a farm because the right to farm law exists. The, the, and that just is a misunderstanding of how this law works. Right to farm laws are all fact dependent. They're all about the activity that is ongoing. It's all about the activity that's alleged to be a nuisance. It's all about the interference with the neighboring property's use. So it, it, this does not prevent someone from bringing litigation against the farm, it, it directs how a court will um, review that litigation and how it is directed to find if the facts play out as they are set forth under this law. Okay. Any other questions from Mike, Senator Starr, any of your committee members? Thank you, Michael, very helpful. Um, our first witness is Gary Tarrant, Chair of Environmental Law Section of Vermont Bar Association. Um. And again, I'm going to ask that people keep their remarks as brief as possible to 10 minutes, no more than 10 minutes, so that we can hear from everyone. Thank you, Gary. Uh, this is Jerry Tarrant. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I received a um, message from Terry Cor Corsones yesterday afternoon and 
asked if I had heard from anyone within the environmental section on this bill. And I noted to her that it was only in the last few days that I had, and several lawyers had commented to me um, uh, concerns about the bill. Um, the added nuisance protections uh, are believed to possibly have the unintended impact of increasing legal liability. Um, I understand protecting ditching and subsurface drainage tile from nuisance suits could encourage their use. However, it's also believed by these lawyers and others that ditches and drainage tile are point sources under the Federal Clean Water Act. An unpermitted discharge of pollutants from a point source, for example, silt and manure discharged from a ditch into Lake Champlain gives rise to a Clean Water Act citizen suit in federal court, 33 USC section 1365. A prevailing plaintiff is entitled to recover attorney's fees and expert costs in federal court. A prevailing defendant is allowed to recover fees only if the citizen suit was unfounded. The point um, these lawyers were trying to make to me and I'm trying to convey to you is that um, this language um, does not prevent federal action. And indeed, I sent um, a case um, from federal court to Peggy before this hearing started, uh, that was written by Judge Oaks back in the 1990s, uh, it, which found a number of different types of activities to be um, uh, under the Clean Water Act uh, in Vermont. Um, it's still good law. Um, the final point I'd make is I, I think this kind of law requires further research with respect to how the, the DEC, the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation would permit discharges. Um, because if they're unpermitted discharges from a point source, then it goes under the Clean Water Act. And, and that's basically what I wanted to convey to you that I think that this is a law that needs to be refined a little bit more to be understood better um, because otherwise you're going to be forcing more litigants into federal court and the um, consequences may be more severe to the farm uh, by going to federal court. So in other words, it would have the, the opposite effect from the, could have the opposite effect from what the Sponsors desired. Yes, sir. Any other questions from Mr. Tarrant? Something <laughs> is going on here that I'm hearing. Peggy, I'll did you hear muted? I think Senator um, <clears throat> Sears. Uh, yeah, you know, we could check that out with the feds and uh, at least a plaintiff would um, have a, an avenue of uh, litigation if, if that is accurate, if they go to take the farmer to federal court. Um, and I don't think we're in a position to regulate federal law, but we can, can and should regulate our state laws. But we should move on and hear the testimony of all. Yep. But I, okay. Thank you. Uh, any other questions, Mr. Tarrant? Any other comments, Mr. Tarrant? Uh, no, um, uh, the only follow-up I would say is that um, this could give uh, farmers and uh, local lawyers, some local lawyers that have not been to federal court and are not familiar with the Clean Water Act, uh, more confidence to bring these kinds of lawsuits uh, that would be uh, probably um, um, 
that, that are probably um, uh, suits that should be uh, brought in federal court. The, the, the suit that I uh, sent to Peggy this morning identifies the kinds of activities that would be considered to be um, uh, point sources and therefore under the Clean Water Act. And, and they clearly talk about the drainage and ditching and tiles and things like that. Um, and that's, that's all I'd, I'd like to mention. Thank you. Uh, Peggy, do you, is that posted? I don't see that language. Uh, that, that, yes, it's uh, posted. I posted as the meeting started. Oh, okay. Well, I'll just... all right. You, um, I've got to start over then. I looked at what was on our webpage before. All right. Thank you, Mr. Tarrant. You're welcome. The next witness is A.J. LaRosa, attorney with MSK Attorneys. Hi, thank you. Um, good morning. I'm, good morning. Thank you all members um, for hearing me today. I was uh, alerted of this bill and asked to share some comments as somebody who has litigated cases just like this in my career. Um, and share some of the concerns or thoughts I had as a, a party to the, not a party, but as a representative of parties to these lawsuits. Uh, first, I do wanna express how exceedingly rare, and I do mean exceedingly rare, nuisance lawsuits are against farmers in the state of Vermont. Uh, the current right to farm bill was passed in 2003. There are two recorded decisions involving the right to farm bill. It has come up twice in 20 years. And in 45, in, in, there are 45 citations in Westlaw going back at least 70 years of now, uh, admittedly the Westlaw records aren't perfect back in 1950, but the term nuisance and farming together in a case appears 45 times in 70 years, going back to pretty good 1950. So these are exceedingly rare cases. Some are um, public and some are not, but they're very, very rare. And uh, one of the members of the committee, uh, my video wasn't quite working right, asked what a nuisance was. Nuisance as a common law right, as defined by the Vermont Supreme Court and as defined by the restatement of second of torts is generally the principle that every person has a duty to make reasonable use of their property so as to ca not cause unnecessary damage or annoyance to a neighbor. Nuisance protects an individual's right to quiet enjoyment of their property and balances on a common law equitable principle my rights to enjoy enjoy my land and your rights to enjoy your land. And what makes usance unique it is a very uh, complex, in terms of fact, question of law that with trespass, which is often referred to as the other side of the coin, depending on what the invasion is into the use and enjoyment, uh, they are very fact sensitive inquiries. And the point of a nuisance case is to balance the very specific facts of each individual complainant and each individual actor. In all the nuisance cases I've been involved in, there is extensive fact analysis. And what makes this bill a bit concerning from a practitioner's perspective is that it takes away the judicial authority to do the equitable balancing that for over 150 years of jurisprudence, nuisance law has been designed to address. The judicial branch is very well suited to hear and adjudicate these fact sensitive questions and removing its ability to do so erodes its authority. In particular, you must view this in light of trespass actions which are the actual physical invasion of, too much, of my property without permission. 
nuisance, nuisance and trespass can occur at the same time from the same thing, but don't have to. Water, let's say for example, um, a farm pond spills pig waste and fouls my well. There are three causes of action, nuisance, trespass, and negligence. This bill would only address one of those three, and it should not address trespass. There has been a physical invasion without permission. Now, one might say, well, they're not in compliance with the required agricultural practices, so this provision wouldn't apply. Maybe they are in good standing. Maybe they aren't. Maybe for some reason this wasn't addressed in the permitting process. Regardless, you have two other causes of action that exist, and you have now litigation over whether or not they're in good standing under this new provision without actually even being able to talk about whether there's an unreasonable invasion or not. So when, when a practitioner looks at this, they just see different litigation without the court having the ability or the authority to do the fact balancing that it's been doing for over 150 years. And as an extremely rare subset of land use litigation, nuisance suits against farmers, a at least from my perspective, this is, um, ha this, I, this doesn't address the core concern and appears unnecessary. A rebuttable presumption is an extraordinarily high standard to bust and serves very well in the context of other permits. For example, if there's a stormwater problem, the existence of a stormwater permit creates a re rebuttable presumption. And we know how to deal with those and we know what the standards and burdens are under that. And so, you know, practitioners rarely cite this. And when they do, it seems like it's in accordance with a hundred years of nuisance jurisprudence. And just practitioner wise, I'm not sure this changes very much or serves a very efficient perspective given the court's well-reasoned practice in nuisance law. That's my thoughts. Thank you. Um, are there questions for Mr. LaRosa? Thank you so much. We really appreciate your testimony. Next is uh, Scott Sanderson, Farm and Food Fellow, Conservation Law Foundation. Good morning. Uh, am I coming through all right? Scott. Yes, you are. Okay. Uh, good morning, Chair Sears, Chair Starr, and members of the committees. Uh, for the record, my name is Scott Sanderson, and I'm a legal fellow with Conservation Law Foundation's Vermont office. Thank you for offering me this opportunity to testify on S-268, uh, legislation that CLF believes would upset the careful balance that Vermont's existing right to farm law already strikes. So as a little bit of background, CLF is a nonprofit, member-supported advocacy organization that protects New England's environment for the benefit of everyone. We use the law, science, and the market to create solutions that preserve our natural resources, build healthy communities, and sustain a vibrant economy. CLF works to support resilient, sustainable agriculture in Vermont for the many health, environmental, and economic benefits that farms provide to our communities. In addition, CLF's Legal Food Hub provides free legal assistance to income eligible small farmers in Vermont and across New England. In Vermont, we operate the program in partnership with Vermont Law School Center for Agriculture and Food Systems. And we've served about 44 farmers and food organizations in the state since our launch here in 2018. So turning to the bill, CLF opposes S-268 because Vermont already has a carefully balanced and successful right to farm law. So the best right to farm laws recognize that conflicts sometimes do develop when non-agricultural land uses encroach upon traditionally agricultural areas. Farmers may face unwarranted nuisance lawsuits brought by new neighbors who are unfamiliar or uncomfortable with what farming entails. Good right to farm laws also recognize power imbalances. In Vermont, it's sometimes the case that a farm's new neighbors uh, are uncomfortable or unfamiliar with farming. Um, and because of that, they, uh, they may bring a lawsuit and they may have more resources than a farmer uh, to pursue that lawsuit than the farmer has to defend it. In those circumstances, lawsuits that unfairly waste a farmer's limited time and resources may force a farmer who did nothing wrong to back down. And this is especially true when farmers face difficult economic times, just like Vermont's dairy farmers do today. 
Now, the best right to farm laws respond to this by protecting farms from unfair nuisance lawsuits while simultaneously preserving their neighbors access to the courts when that access is justified, such as when health, safety or welfare are in jeopardy. Good right to farm laws are a balancing act. They, prevent, they protect a farmer's right to farm free from harassment with a neighbor's right to use and enjoy their property in good health and safety. Good right to farm laws don't pick a side. Instead, they create conditions that allow farm communities to thrive even as they welcome new neighbors who may or may not be farmers. Now, I think Vermont's current right to farm law is among the best in the country. As a result, Vermont's farmers are really not threatened by unwarranted nuisance lawsuits. So as we heard from earlier witnesses, uh, Vermont's existing right to farm law entitles farms to a rebuttable presumption that their agricultural activities do not constitute a nuisance if those activities are consistent with the law, are consistent with good agricultural practices, existed before surrounding non-agricultural activities, and have not changed significantly since the surrounding non-agricultural activities began. A farm's neighbor can only overcome that presumption if they can show that the agricultural activity in question has a substantial adverse effect on health, safety, or welfare, or has a noxious and significant interference on the use and enjoyment of the neighbor's property. Here we see the balancing that is characteristic of good right to farm laws. A farm that follows good agricultural practices and the relevant regulations can't be a nuisance just because a new neighbor doesn't understand farming. But that neighbor's access to the courts is protected if the farm goes beyond what is reasonable and begins to threaten health, safety, or welfare. Moreover, Vermont's current right to farm law carefully combines legislative and agency expertise with the judicial system's core competences. Right now, lawmakers and expert agencies like AAFM make the first decision with respect to what can be considered a nuisance in Vermont. If lawmakers and agencies don't think that a farming practice is normal or that it threatens public health, they can prohibit that practice and deny farmers right to farms rebuttable presumption. Otherwise, farmers benefit from the presumption and the scales tip in their favor. The current law then goes on to recognize that lawmakers and regulators can't think of everything. Activities that are entitled to right to farms rebuttable presumption may nonetheless threaten health or safety. Consequently, the law gives courts their traditional role to apply the law to fill the gaps uh, and do so in a way that is consistent with law, policy, regulation, and precedent. This leaves the courts a limited but important role in dealing with unforeseen or extreme situations that threaten health or safety. Now, Vermont's careful balancing has succeeded and nuisance lawsuits against Vermont's farms are very rare. Now, even if Vermont lacked a right to farm law, it would still be relatively difficult to show that a Vermont farm is a nuisance under most circumstances. As the Vermont Supreme Court has explained, to be considered a nuisance, an individual's interference with the use and enjoyment of another's property must be both unreasonable and substantial. To be substantial, the harm must be more than the customary interference a land user suffers in organized society, and it must be offensive to the normal person in the community. A normal person in Vermont realizes that their neighbors may be farmers, and they know that living in a farm community means that they need to accommodate farms. It follows that the Vermont Supreme Court has also explained that, in general, the unsightliness of a thing without more does not render it a nuisance under the law. In other words, nuisance isn't about taste. It's not enough for a neighbor to dislike farming. The neighbor must suffer an actual real harm. So when Vermont's existing right to farm law pairs with the state's nuisance law, farmers are very well protected. In fact, based on my research, the Vermont Supreme Court has only mentioned Vermont's current right to farm law in a couple of cases and right to farm didn't play a role in those decisions. The takeaway I think is that Vermont already has a balanced right to farm law that protects farmers from unfair lawsuits and preserves their neighbors access to the courts when health, safety or welfare are truly on the line. With this law in place, nuisance lawsuits are rare against farms and there simply isn't a problem here for new legislation to solve. Now, S-268 would substantially change Vermont's policy and upset the careful balance that Vermont has already struck. Uh, I'd like to emphasize that S-268 is not an update. It's a wholesale policy change. Instead of carefully balancing a farmer's and a neighbor's interests by creating a rebuttable presumption, S-268 dismisses the neighbor's concerns altogether. It would prohibit the courts from finding that an agricultural activity is a nuisance in a variety of circumstances, including if the farm is in good standing with AAFM. S-268 provides no exceptions, even where a neighbor's health, safety, or welfare is threatened. While Vermont's current right to farm law protects the right to farm free from harassment, S-268 attempts to go much further than that. 
S-268 also upsets the careful combination of legislative, agency, and judicial expertise that Vermont's current right to farm law embodies. It does this by cutting out the judiciary, effectively denying their courts their limited but important role in dealing with unforeseen or extreme situations that threaten health or safety. Of course, it's true that right to farm law similar to Vermont's has become very rare in the United States. Uh, while the Vermont Supreme Court commented in 2003 that other states had right, have retained a rebuttable presumption component in their right to farm laws. The fact that Vermont's right to farm law is unique, however, doesn't mean that it's outdated or deficient. Vermont often finds itself in the national minority when it passes and retains well-considered effective legislation that's right for Vermont. Here, Vermont should stand unique and leave its existing right to farm law in effect. Vermont has managed to protect its farmers from unwarranted lawsuits while also protecting neighbors. That balance is a very rare achievement. So for these reasons, uh, CLF urges these committees to leave Vermont's right to farm law in place and not to support S-268. Thank you for your time. Uh, I will... Senator Starr or questions anyone have. questions? Does anybody have any questions? Thank you very much, Scott. Appreciate your testimony. Next, we have John Groveman from the Vermont Natural Resources Council. Good morning, and can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. So good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. Um, for the record, uh, I'm John Groveman, Policy and Water Program Director for the uh, Vermont Natural Resources Council, or VNRC. Um, my testimony today uh, is informed by my work as an environmental lawyer for over 30 years. As part of my work as an environmental lawyer, I've served as general counsel for the Agency of Natural Resources and VNRC. And I also teach an environmental law course at Norwich University that includes a unit on environmental liability. Um, as you will, I'll go through my testimony, which is pretty brief. You uh, explain the reasons why VNRC uh, opposes S-268, which um, we view as a significant expansion um, of the right to farm law in, in Vermont. So VNRC agrees with CLF that Vermont's right to farm bill is working, and then S-268 represents a significant policy shift that would disturb the careful balance that Scott articulated between shielding farms from liability when people move near existing farms that are operating in compliance with the law while also under the current law, Vermonters are able to seek relief to address legitimate threats to the use and enjoyment of their property, which have you heard from CLF and uh, Attorney LaRosa is shorthand for the legal standard for, uh, for, for nuisance. Um, in addition, given the fact that you've heard, the facts that you've already heard from the previous witnesses that Vermont has seen so few nuisance lawsuits, against farms, it appears to VNRC that the right to farm law is working as is, and S-268 uh, appears to be a solution in search of a problem. I'd like to focus on um, a major way that S-268 removes the balanced approach from Vermont's right to farm law to kind of just paint a picture. So under the existing law, the existing right to farm law, all elements of the right to farm statute must be met to shield a farm from nuisance liability. For example, under the current law, to be shielded from liability, a person must move to the nuisance. So the farm existed before the person moved near the farm and, um, and raised concerns about the farm. Uh, and, and the farm must be operating consistent with good practices and compliance with the law. So both elements would be needed. In contrast, under S-268, simply demonstrating compliance with agricultural practices would be enough to shield a farm from liability, whether the person moved to the nuisance or not. Accordingly, a farm could start up in an area that may be near residential commercial uses, and the neighboring property owners would be precluded from addressing uh, any activities on the farm that basically came to them, as if the farm could show that they were complying with uh, state agricultural water quality laws. In VNRC's view, there are several problems with this approach. One is that a nuisance may have nothing to do with agricultural water quality. For example, a common nuisance example involves air quality. Secondly, VNRC has for years been tracking instances where there are significant disputes regarding whether compliance with agricultural water quality laws actually protect public health and the environment. 
our analysis has been that compliance with state law does not always ensure that will be there will not be impacts on public health and the environment if you're in good standing with these laws. Um, but this would preclude a nuisance lawsuit um, under under S two sixty eight as drafted. It is important to note that farms are already exempt from virtually all environmental laws in Vermont, and there are other provisions that shield farms from liability under Vermont law or shift liability. One example is um, 10 VSA section 1676A. If a farm contaminates a public water supply, the public water supply is required to abandon its water source at its own expense. VNRC believes these kind of limits and shifts in liability when anyone is responsible for causing harm, including a farm, should be curtailed rather than expanded. And to that end, we see S-268 as a move in the wrong direction. It is VNRC's understanding that an argument in favor of the bill is that most states take a right to farm approach that is consistent with S-268. VNRC does not believe this is a good rationale for abandoning a right to farm approach that has worked in Vermont. There are a number of examples when Vermont takes an approach that differs from a majority of states because it is a policy that works for and fits Vermont. For example, as the committee is well aware, the Senate has now three times passed a law that would allow for a cause of action for medical monitoring if a person has been harmed by the release of toxic pollution. Only 16 other states allow for this cause of action. However, this committee and the Vermont legislature has decided that the minority approach to this liability issue will better serve Vermonters. Vermont has a history of tailoring legal policies that are right for us. The right to farm law is such a Vermont policy that works for Vermont and it shouldn't be changed. Finally, VNRC understands that one of the things driving this bill is the legal action taken against um, a farm in Addison County that Attorney O'Grady referenced uh, at the beginning of the hearing. VNRC is aware of this case and believes it is an example of the significant impacts farming can have on water quality, even if state water quality laws are being followed. However, we don't know as we sit here today what the court will find with regard to the nuisance claim made in that case. And we don't know whether the right to farm law will shield the farmer from a nuisance claim, or if the court decides that it doesn't, what the analysis was. Accordingly, we just, it, it doesn't seem right to, to make this wholesale shift in Vermont policy that has significant, <laughs> raises significant issues as you've already heard, based on a lawsuit that we don't even know the outcome of. Um, those are, that is the remarks I wanted to make today. Again, thank you for the opportunity to testify on the bill and happy to answer any questions. John, in, in light of the, the one lawsuit that brings this bill, um, and in light of Mr. Terrence's comments about unintended consequences, do you agree with that? That there, there may be unintended consequences where the farm would actually be more liable under this, under federal law? I, I see Mr. Terrence's point, and I was contacted by a couple of uh, the same lawyers that probably contacted Mr. Tarrant, and I hadn't thought of it, but I, I do see the argument that I think what Mr. Tarrant and the attorneys raising this issue were saying, um, if you cut off state courts as an uh, avenue, it, it'll force people to look at federal courts and exercise that right in federal law. So I like to think about it more because I, I haven't researched it myself, but I, I certainly understand the argument they're making and it seems to have merit. Okay, thank you. Thank Next you. witness is uh, James Maroney from Addison County, Oliver Hill Farm. Jay, welcome. Um, Jay and I go back over 60 years now. That ages us both, doesn't it? Yeah. Welcome, Jay. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Senator Sears, uh, for this opportunity. Um, I, uh, uh, I had prepared rem remarks. Um, I've had to uh, delete most of it because you've asked us to keep this short. So uh, um, my full remarks are posted. I think Peggy Delaney has posted my, uh, my uh, remarks for today. I'm going to read the, what I consider uh, uh, the most important 
uh, parts of it. I'd, I'd like to begin by by saying how important it is that uh, Senator Sears asked uh, why the bill doesn't define nuisance. Uh, and uh, that's an excellent point. Uh, and I'd like but I'd like to I'd like to assert um, that um, that the state of Vermont uh, ha has always regarded uh, a, a farm uh, pollution incidents such as the one uh, in the Vorstevelt uh, Hopper uh, case as incidental. That is to say, um, th uh, there's a little, th this farm is uh, uh, um, not following the rules here and we have to deal with that. But in, in my view, um, what the Hoppers uh, should have been asserting in their lawsuit was not an incident uh, from the, th that is emanating from the uh, from the Vorstevelt farm and transiting their land on its way to the lake. The, the real cause of the problem here is uh, systemic, not incidental. Um, I'm going to assert in my remarks that the problem with Vermont farming uh, is related to its adoption in the 1950s or early 60s of what we now refer to as conventional farming. I also think it's pretty interesting that in the, in the um, uh, hour or so that we've been discussing this issue, I've not heard one mention of the state's new Global Warming Solutions Act, not one mention. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I would also assert that if the, that that perhaps the instigation or the motivation for Act 268 uh, or uh, here or S 268, I mean to say, uh, is uh, an awareness on the part of uh, Vermont conventional dairy that it is a nuisance, uh, and therefore, uh, oh my God, we better uh, we better do. We're nervous about this. I mean, why does the why does the state of Vermont, or why do the farmers, for that matter, if they're ready to concede that uh, that uh, that they need a bill, are they not conceding at the same time that uh, that um, that farming is a nuisance? And I, and I don't mean a, an incidental nu nuisance; I mean a systemic one. So he here are some. Uh, I'm going to read a little bit from my prepared remarks. Um, conventional farming was predicated on the notion that farmers did not need to rely on the slow natural methods they had relied on for millennia. They could buy artificial nutrients derived from cheap, plentiful petroleum. The new paradigm offered farmers the welcome opportunity to exchange costly, time-consuming crop rotation and mechanical weed control with chemicals. The paradigm worked wonders for early adopters. Yields rose and costs fell. But the chemicals did not dissipate harmlessly. They were toxic, and they were accumulating in the atmosphere and the water more troublesome for farmers, higher yields for early adopters quickly translated into surpluses that drove down farm prices for them all. Farmers were famously advised to get big or get out. Most of them got out. But allocating taxpayer dollars to dozens of programs designed only on their faces to save farming and protect the lake failed to do either. In the mistaken belief that farming was conservation, the legislature enacted laws designed to keep them on the land by exempting them from sales and property taxes, labor laws, and liability from nuisance. But farmers applied the savings to pay for new capacity, sending more milk to markets already saturated and more poison into the already polluted lake and atmosphere. These laws have never been scrutinized, so they're all still in effect. The undeniable result of them is a severely polluted lake an existentially polluted atmosphere, and a dairy industry reduced from 11,000 farms in 1945 to only 650 today, an attrition of 94%. Skipping over a lot of what I wrote. Uh, there is a bill before the legislature to strengthen the right to farm law. The, state legislative, uh, the stated legislative intent of which was to protect farmers from nuisance suit brought by neighbors who object to noise and or pollution generated in the course of doing the farm's vital work, i.e. producing our food, quote unquote. Uh, but Vermont agriculture does not produce our food. It produces barely 1% of the nation's milk supply and a vanishingly small part of the nation's supply of meat, vegetables, fruit, and fiber. The right to farm law's first intent was to suppress development. Its second was to protect the stream of taxpayer support to an industry losing money and polluting the lake. Its third was to assure farmers that they were free to apply chemicals and toxins to our soil, water, and air. And its fourth was to shore up the state's flimsy contention 
that the required agricultural practices rules were saving agriculture and protecting the lake. A live example of this point of view is the state's implicit support of the Vorstevelds, the target of a suit brought by a neighbor alleging that defendants are allowing runoff from their farm to transit plaintiff's land and flow into Lake Champlain. Both sides have stipulated there is pollution coming off the farm. I have no doubt the court will find the Vorstevelds have inadvertently broken some minor rule, but are otherwise in compliance with the RAPs. The court will require them to adjust their practices and then allow them to go on about their business as usual. Uh, conventional farming supporters want to strengthen the right to farm law to avoid suits like this, but chiefly, they want to avoid opening up the RAPs or any kind of examination of Vermont's agricultural policies. These same people are urgently petitioning the legislator to allocate even more tax dollars to support not Vermont dairy, but the illusion that the industry is robust, vibrant, strong, vital, and resilient. These same people, if they have thought about it at all, are unconcerned that the purpose of the right to farm law and the Global uh, Warming Solutions Act are contraindicated. They urge us to pay conventional dairy farmers for so-called echo services, i.e. pay them extra to continue farming conventionally. These same, same people want the Vermont Agency of Agriculture to double down on its disinformation campaign to keep the public from knowing how the state has shielded conventional Vermont dairy farmers from the inescapable laws of economics. Distinguished members of the Senate Judiciary, I implore you to stop and consider what 60 years of, Vermont, uh, of Vermont's agricultural policies hath wrought. In your own lifetimes, 94% of Vermont dairy farmers have watched as a flood of cheap toxic chemicals, all permitted under the RAPs, have reduced years of hard labor and billions of dollars worth of farm capital to ashes. Three billion taxpayer dollars up the flu, and the, still, st and the state still permits this industry to send its wastes into the lake and the atmosphere. Who wanted this result? I'd be happy to answer your questions if you have. Thank you, Jay. Are there questions for uh, Mr. Maroney? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, appreciate your testimony and, and thank you for keeping it brief. Uh, I did read your um, testimony on the, that you've written and it's on our webpage. Thank you. So thank you for that. And uh, perhaps we'll get together in the near future. The reminisce about old times. All right, uh, Diane. Um, I'm sorry, Diane Butterf Bothfield, Administrative Services Director, Agency of Agriculture, is our next witness. Uh, thank you, Senator Sears, and and other uh, assembled uh, legislators. Thank you for inviting us to speak today. Um, our general counsel, Steve Collier, is also listed, so I'll let him uh, talk to the legal aspects. I will let you know that the agency uh, receives several calls uh, each year asking what's going on with this farm. They're bothering me. They're causing causing issues. This is all types of farms. This is from somebody who has 10 chickens in the backyard, a few beef cattle, all the way up to the largest farms in Vermont. Uh, it's a level of education that uh, these practices that, yes, the cows moo in the morning when they're hungry. It may be 5 a.m., but they do moo, or the chickens cluck, or the rooster crows. So this is all types of farms, conventional, organic, as well as you know our small backyard folks who are just trying to feed their families all the way up to our largest farms in Vermont. So it is a variety of questions that the agency receives and we try to provide education. Uh, that may be why there are few suits, I'm not sure, uh, but certainly an area of concern. Uh, there was also a report earlier this year called Vermont Voices uh, that I think um, I will provide to your legislative assistants so you can look at that. It talks about the imbalance between the agricultural community and those that are um, in the NGO community at the Agency of Agriculture, et cetera. So several folks that spoke today are paid and paid well to be here, just like me. And I would see the rest of my time so that you can hear from the farmers that have not had a chance to speak yet, uh, who are independent business people and every moment they wait on this call is a moment that they're not being paid 
uh, for their labor. So I would cede my, my time at this point, but thank you very much. And um, I, will, I will answer questions if needed. Does the agency yeah. of agriculture support the bill? Uh, the bill was not introduced by the agency of agriculture, but the agency of agriculture could support the changes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Collier, General Counsel, Ag Ag Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets. Thank you so much, Senator Sears, and thanks to all of you for inviting us to talk about this um, very important topic. And to be clear on Senator Sears' last point, the agency absolutely supports this bill and thinks it's very important for farmers. I'd like to start, if I may, by just quickly addressing a couple of the points that came up in earlier in earlier conversations. The first is the issue about subsurface drainage and tile. That is in the current statute. So I'm not sure how that would, how the, the new version the new bill would change that in any way. It's already protected under the current right to farm bill. The second is a comment made about 150 years of nuisance litigation and how nothing has changed. I would suggest that it's changed dramatically because 150 years ago, almost everyone in Vermont was a farmer. Today, almost no one is. That's a very important difference when considering farming. I mean, please keep in mind that what this bill addresses is farmers performing their jobs legally. There are not many professions where somebody can be sued for a nuisance when they're performing their job legally at their home. Farmers can be. And it is not at all surprising to me that all of the lawyers uh, who have spoken to date are very pleased with the current law because it is in fact riddled with holes. And, and what, I, what I would urge all of you to, to look at very carefully is the intent section of the current right to farm law. If you read that intent section, you would come away believing that farmers are very well protected that Vermont has taken a policy position that farming is important, that farming is critical, in fact, to, to our state, our economy, to our local food development. You would believe that the state of Vermont has protected farming. That's what the purpose says. It also talks, the intent section also talks about preserving changing farming and innovation in farming. And that's a critical point when you, when you evaluate whether this change is warranted. When you read the statute itself, however, all it does is create a series of factual questions. It creates first the farmer, first in order to be complying with the right to farm law, there are four different factual questions that are at stake. Even if the farmer can show that they've met all of those standards, including, including complying with all federal, state, local laws and the required agricultural practices, that's one thing they have to they have to be able to prove at the outset to be able to have this defense apply to them. Then there are a series of other factual questions that they have to look to have to be able to prove that for the defense to apply. And even if they meet those four first factual standards, they then are subject to a rebuttable presumption where the plaintiff can still overcome that defense if they can, if the plaintiff can show an adverse uh, adverse impact on their safety, health, or welfare, or a noxious interference with their use of property, so the reason I bring up these things at all is that factual questions are not a good way to create a meaningful defense. If you actually want to help farmers from dispensing with litigation quickly, factual questions mean extensive litigation. They mean arguments on all sides. They mean a trial rather than disposition on a motion for summary judgment. Each one of these different criteria is something that, that by definition has to be developed in, in a factual way. Now, the reason that's important is that farmers, <laughs> as we all know, have limited resources. And if you are defending a suit against your neighbor in court, it's probably going to cost you about two to $300 an hour to hire an attorney. So that means for one week of an attorney's time, that's about eight to $12,000 for one week of an attorney's time. If an attorney has to develop factual questions like, 
Is the smell when a farmer agitates their manure pit a noxious interference with their neighbor's property? If you have to get experts to talk about that, if you have to interview people, depose people, if you have to marshal the evidence to determine whether the smell from agitating your manure pit so that you can spread it, which is required, by the way, uh, or can be a required practice, depending on what the manure pit is on the farm. But we do require farmers to have manure pits so that their manure is contained and can be spread appropriately and not be deposited into our rivers and streams. That, that issue can take months and months of an attorney's time to, to litigate that, even if the farmer wins. So what I would suggest is that the nuisance action by itself is a plaintiff can win simply by having their day in court, irrespective of whether they win in the end. It can create tremendous pressure on farmers. It can create tremendous pressure irrespective of whether a plaintiff neighbor files a suit because the leverage that currently exists in the law allows neighbors to apply pressure to farmers if they want to. So I think the question from, from the agency's perspective is if the state protect farming, if you want to meet that intent that's in the intent section, I think Mr. O'Grady's version of the bill actually is designed to effectuate the very intent that was adopted long ago. And it's not in any way an absolute bar from nuisance suits. There are still a number of criteria that have to be met for farmers to comply. They can't just be you know, doing whatever they want. But the question I think is who should be setting the farming standards? If we value farming in Vermont, if we believe it's important to have local food production and to actually be able to consume our local food and not to rely on food that's trucked in from somewhere else and, and we'll never meet that standard completely, but everyone I think recognizes in this era of the pandemic and in the supply chain issues that not having access to local food is a risk that really none of us should want to take. But if we value that having local food, if we value our landscape, which is 80% wooded, most of the open land is farmed. If we value our farming industry, which is about 5% of our GDP, I think, if we value the tourism that our farms bring and that our landscape brings, if we value those things, I think the question becomes, who do we want making the policies about what is allowed for farming in Vermont? Do we want it to be the state? And by that, I mean by state through regulation because farms are heavily regulated now. That's another big difference from 150 years ago. Farms have been increasingly regulated every year, including since the right to farm Act was first adopted, the regulations have gone way up. So if we value farming and we are regulating farming in a way that we believe is in the public interest, do we want an extra layer where every neighbor to every farm can also dictate what is permissible farming? Does, does every neighbor have a say in whether the smell of a manure pit is too much, whether the noise associated with farming is, is too much? When you look at the time that the Supreme Court did interpret the right to farm law, they said that an apple orchard, which had long as they started waxing their own apples and storing them on their property, that was not covered because that was a significant change in use. Our current statute still has that, that provision that if there's a significant change in use in farming, the right to farm protection does not exist. If you look at the intent provision, you would, you would believe that changes in use were absolutely allowed. We encourage our farmers to diversify. We have less than 600 dairy farms left in the state. We, we, we encourage them to do everything they can to be able to make enough money. If we are going to allow them to do that, then they need to be able to grow, change, adapt. The current version of the statute does not protect anyone who's involved in a significant use. So I think I, I would love to say more. I recognize I'm getting a little bit long already. I really appreciate your time, but there are very important changes at issue here. And I would just encourage everyone to look at the intent of what the law, current law says and see if the statute meets it. And I, and I don't think it does. Whereas the bill in S-268 actually does meet the intent of the original statute that you already adopted. So thank you so much. Thank you. Are there any questions from Mr. Collier? Thank you very much. Our next witness is um, Heather Darby, Associate Professor at UVM Extension.
I don't see Heather. Oh, there she is. I don't see her yet. Well, I see her. She's muted, and I don't know if she heard us. Um, why don't we jump to David Werner, owner of Werner Tree Farm? Um, and then come Heather back just to came Heather. on. Oh, I'm sorry, Heather. Go ahead, please, with uh, Mr. Darby on. Um, Heather, with David Werner on deck. Go ahead, Heather, if you're good. Second, I'm trying to. There you go. We can yeah. see you now, Heather. Okay. Yep. And an interesting morning here with the, the ice and the snow. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Sorry about that. Trying to get situated in here. All right. Well, thank you again for, for having me this morning and um, just a, a minute to, to talk about this important, important bill. And um, it, it's funny over, over the almost 20 years now that I've been with extension, I feel like uh, so much of my work has been as um, a social worker <laughs> between farmers and their neighbors. Um, and it, you know, although I think uh, I heard Diane Bothfeld mentioning, we don't have a lot of lawsuits that come up. A lot of those are commonly diverted by trying to communicate and trying to educate. Um, but it's definitely becoming increasingly harder and more difficult to do that in every instance because you know the number of farms we have relative to the number of people that don't farm in Vermont, you know, that disparity is just growing and growing and growing. And I think we all know the desire of people to move in, into our state is high and getting higher. Um, and, and certainly the projections with climate change, we know that there'll be just even more increasing pressure um, for people to move here because, you know, our location um, is desirable and sort of out of the main, the main impacts around climate change, not that we're not feeling it as well. So this has put just more increasing pressure um, and angst between often neighbors and farmers. And, and even, and I think this is a group that people don't think about very often, but even individuals that are trying to grow food for their own family. And um, I hear this a lot, and I actually hear it from folks that work with me that have homesteads that are constantly feeling that pressure um, and, again, conflict between them and their neighbors. They're trying to raise some beef cattle trying to raise some chickens, have some eggs, have a bigger garden. Um, so it's not just, <laughs> it's not just commercial farms. It's not just commercial dairy. We hear this all across the board from homesteaders to small vegetable producers. I had a case this summer where I had a neighbor blockading a driveway um, that was not theirs because the vegetable farm was spreading poultry manure. And the neighbors were blockading the driveway for the driver to come in and spread that manure because of the smell. And, you know, it just, <laughs> it was really harsh. And this is on a tiny, you know, 20 acre organic, vegetable farm that sells to the person driveway to have the fertility spread. So there's really, um, you know, just this growing, growing disparity between, you know, people understanding what it takes to grow food, whether it's, you know, a gallon of milk or a carrot, 
um, to put food on a table, most people think about how they have to shop every week, go to the grocery store, hope it has what they want, um, bring it home, hope they have the money to buy it, bring it home, and then how are they going to cook it, you know, but there's very little thought or understanding or education of how much it took to get that little bean <laughs> tree store or even to a farm stand, you know? And so it's getting more difficult. The situations are also getting more volatile often. Like I said, this, this was nuts. I just, I couldn't believe these people who had lived, they, they had lived in this house, um, I would say temporarily, I guess, you know, over the years for a couple of years, but moved in permanently um, after like in the middle of COVID and just out with their car blocking the driveway, screaming at the driver, yelling at them. Um, you know, this is, this isn't want to be able to be producing food. And, you know, there's more than laws that really have to go into place. But again, you know, some of the decisions made on farms have to happen in real time. And often, you know, weather or, you know, a storm. I'm thinking about this morning, getting a call from a farmer whose parlor burnt down. Um, and they're looking for a home for, you know, their cows to get them milked. And the neighbors are all over the place and the smell and the smoke. And, you know, there's just um, the growing angst from community members and also from the farmers. And, and like I said, there's more than laws that we need here. We need some real education around agriculture. And, and I'm, I hear um, Mr. Maroney talking. It's not that I don't hear that, but, but this is across all types of farms and individual homesteads that are trying to feed their neighbors, themselves. You know, it's not just large farms we're talking about here and it's getting more difficult to operate. And I'm sure you'll hear that from many other people. I, I'm seeing the names on here and, um, you know, th things are different and, and we need to be able to grow the food to feed the people. Um, and that's going to, if you don't think it's important now, <laughs> the climate change um, is here and is getting worse. You know, we have to secure our ability to feed ourselves here in the state. Um, it's already evolving. People are already doing things really differently to feed their neighbors and put, you know, food on the shelves. We saw that during the pandemic, you know, this desire to buy from your neighbor because you couldn't get it in the store, that's gonna become more and more and more constant and important. And we have to be able to give people the ability to produce food for us, to feed us. Um, okay. So thank you. Thank you. Um, obviously we're gonna to try to get to everybody, but we're not gonna make it. We've got about an hour left and I don't know how this got so big, but clearly, um, We've got you a know lot how, of Senator, left. because it's so oh. important and people yes. care. Uh, really. Excuse me. Um, oh, boy. All right. I know how. My apologies, Senator. I meant yeah, because um, it's so important. Well, I understand that. I was commenting on the number of witnesses we tried to schedule in a small time, not on whether it was important or not. And I don't appreciate the comment. Apology accepted. Uh, David Werner, owner of Werner Tree Farm. This is our next witness. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, great. Okay. Um, I live in Middlebury with my wife. We have a Christmas tree farm. We sugar. We have animals, horses, and sheep, and we hay. 
I have farmed the piece of property that I live on for 52 years now. In that 52 years, the area around our farm has gotten built up and particularly in the last two or three years, it's gotten built up tremendously. And what I'm finding is the practices that we do to maintain our farm apparently are interfering with people that aren't used to farming. The references to the cost of a lawyer, I think are very valid. What I see in this bill, which would um, let's say update the current bill a little bit, is it, it sets a layer that anybody that wants to sue a farmer would have to accept, or they would have to be aware that it, it's, a bear, it's a bar that you have to get to. So maybe it would eliminate some of the lawsuits if this was passed. So briefly, what I run into is spreading manure, I get in trouble, meaning I'm spreading it on my own land, on my own driveway, and I get yelled at for doing it. If we are mowing our Christmas trees or hay too early in the morning, it bothers people. And I try to be considerate when we do this. Um, I guess one of the things, our Christmas tree business, which is primarily choose and cut, and we do about 1,500 trees a year now, has grown and is continuing to grow. We have two sites that we work out of. And we have a parking lot on a remote site. That parking lot is near houses that keep getting upscaled. And it's creating problems when we have people going in and out of our driveway because it's a common driveway with another house. So I don't want to waste a lot of your time. Um, I just wanted to say that it's there's different types of farming in Vermont. I don't think farming is a minuscule part just because dairy farming isn't as prevalent as it used to be. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, <clears throat> thank you, David. You're welcome. Have a good day. Uh, Paul Marza, Marza Farms. And then Who's Walter that? Gladstone. Yeah, that's good, Dick. We should keep one on deck, save as much time as we can. Yeah. We'll try to get to everybody. I did. Uh, the numbers are just astounding, and I don't know how that happened. Uh, this was not designed to be a public hearing. Oh, I thought. Well, well yeah, well, certainly did. Where is uh, Mr. Mazza? Senator Sears, while you're waiting, this is Jackie Folsom from the Farm Bureau, and I would like to yield my time to the farmers. I think their voices are more important to be heard. And I will gladly submit the Farm Bureau testimony in, uh, in writing to both the, the committees so that you can have some more time to listen to the farmers. If that's Thank you. Well, that will help. Um, I, I see Paul Mazza on. Thank you, Jackie. Paul, go ahead. Over the since COVID has hit, we've had a lot of people call on us, whether we're spraying or spreading manure in Chittenden County more than ever. The state has been behind me. Matt, um, wood has come down, check my logs. Everything checks out. It's so far all gone away, but there's going to be a time when it isn't going to go away. It seems out in Colchester, a lot of people are moving in, spreading manure. I'm trying to do it more organically, and we get complaints. But I'm getting more complaints now than I ever have. And it, we had two last year. We seem like to get more every year. But the state has been behind me so, so far. I don't know what to say after that, but uh, I've listened to everything you guys said, and so far it's worked out. There'll be some day it may not work out. It depends who has more money, I guess. Uh, 
Next is Walter Gladstone, board member of Vermont Dairy Producers. Thank you, Paul. You're welcome. <clears throat> Am I on? You're on. Yes. Thank what you. Uh, statement. Exactly what you wanted to say. Thank you, Chairman. Who has more money? Paul, you're still. Paul, you're still. You're not. You okay? Now you're muted. Thanks. Thank you for this opportunity, Chairman Sears and uh, Chairman Starr and, and and members of the committee. Um, I'm Walt Gladstone. Uh, I'm representing on behalf of this testimony on behalf of the Connecticut River Watershed Farmers Alliance, the Vermont Dairy Producers Alliance, and on behalf of Newmont Farm. My wife and I started Newmont Farm 33 years ago. We have three sons. Two of our sons are in business with us today. Will's 33 and my son Matt's 29 and they're both an in intricate part of helping us manage our dairy operation and, and produce business. Both sons are married with children, and we look forward to the potential of the next generation farmers behind us. <clears throat> we have 30 employees that help us uh, put out a quality product, uh, sometimes making cabbage cheese, quality beef, and quality pumpkins that are sold throughout New England. We farm in the Connecticut River Valley. We grow and harvest around 1,200 acres of corn, 1,000 acres of grass is harvested, and we have 200 acres of pumpkins. We are currently milking around 1,800 cows. Just for the record as well, I think it's important. I grew up on a farm of 34 cows, and my wife uh, grew up here in Vermont with a herd of 120 cows. And uh, I think it's really important that we, we look at these dairy operations <clears throat> more so as a sum of the pieces, not just one big farm or a small farm, but in our case, we probably have 20 different farms that we're working together with that it's just not our farm. It's how we are economically all working together and everyone's making a living. Before COVID, we put on an open farm day the 1st of June uh, for probably five years. We're gonna have an open farm day this uh, June as well. <clears throat> we feel it's really important for the people in our community to continue to learn about current farm practices. We open up the farm for four hours, put on tours and such. <clears throat> we know as it's been stated here this morning, there's less far people in farming and the people directly tied to these farms are further removed. We also put out a farm letter twice a year to four surrounding towns to share practices that we, we and other farmers are um, using in new technologies. Examples to that would be dragline manure, no-till corn planting, no-till pumpkin planting, and cover crops. As we all know, the dairy farming is an integral uh, part of our economy, the culture and landscape of Vermont. Dairy products uh, account for 65% of the agricultural sales here in Vermont, generate over 500 million in annual uh, revenue to the state. The dairy industry in Vermont contributes 2.2 billion in economic activity to the state each year. We know the state is noted for the bright foliage, the rolling pastures in the landscape of the state. Over 50% of the farmland in Vermont is used for dairy farming and other activities. Even with this importance to the economy and, and the dairy farming has had over the years, as it's been stated in year 2000, there were, two th there were 1,600 farms and today there are fewer than 600. That's a 60% loss. The loss of these farms possesses a real threat to Vermont's historic core, its rural economy, its character and working landscape. The presence and main maintenance of dairy farms also ensures the state will have resources to maintain food security. You know, and it's been mentioned this morning, you know, how little uh, food comes from the state, but it does come from the state 
and it's important that we regionally have access to regional food. <clears throat> Some of the reasons why I support uh, the passage of this bill, as I read, uh, you know, I think Senator Starr, I read at one point in time, this bill has been in a bill similar to this has been in place over 40 years. We're updating it, we're modifying it with the rec as the regulations. Um, uh, we, we, we have to operate under the required agriculture practices. This bill helps all agriculture <clears throat> and all farms in Vermont. It protect that advancements that are made for soil health, water quality measures that are under the state and federal guidelines, which happen faster than public opinion. It allows those who understand you could, uh, agriculture. Could wind down, please. Yep, yep, yep. I've got a lot of witnesses behind it. I guess my point is at the end, is farming has always been challenging dealing with so many different issues, and today is no different. Um, I think it's important for the keeping farm community active in the state for this um, bill to be passed. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Sears, <clears throat> Senator yeah. Sears could I yeah. just interrupt briefly and say to Mr. Yeah. Gladstone, I also appreciate your willingness to keep your land open, especially in my case for allowing me to swing my metal detector in the oxbow of your backyard. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Walt. Um, I think Bill Emmons is next. You hear me? Oops. Yes, I think so. It's, Are you, uh, you Bill? Sorry. Yeah, I'm Bill. We Bill. can okay, hear you. We, we can't see you. There I you are. Kind of, yeah, yeah. Got the right, right button pushed. Uh, thank you, Senator Sears and members of the uh, Senate Judiciary. Um, my name is Bill Emmons, and I've um, run my family's farm down in uh, near Woodstock in the town of Pomfret. Um, it's a thousand acre farm, mostly woodland, and it's got a history of um, giving, basically. We have the Appalachian Trail running through in a, in a very long mile or more section of vast corridor snowmobile trails. We also have, uh, over the years, value added our beef product. Um, we, we transitioned years ago from dairy into the beef world, and I have an Angus herd, and it now um, it now provides uh, beef for local uh, consumers as well as a restaurant that we've uh, built here at our farm called uh, Cloudland Farm Restaurant. The, um, this has put me under a microscope of sorts, although I've been known in this community for a long time, having grown up here. This farm purchased in 1908 by my grandfather. The, um, the opportunity to serve my community has been a wonderful one in that I've been a chair for many, many years of a, the uh, Two Rivers Ottaquichi Regional Planning Commission, as well as my local um, planning commission, as well as numerous beef producers and other um, agricultural pursuits, the most recent being the Connecticut River Watershed Farmers Alliance. So I'm going to read to you right now a quick little thing that I've written. It's mostly an emotional sort of plea, although I have listened carefully to you, your uh, witnesses, and I do appreciate all um, points of view, especially Heather Darby, whom I respect more than anybody in the agricultural world. Um, and, um, but I do enjoy listening to both points of view. So what I have to say is um, that it is increasingly difficult to be a passionate advocate for American agriculture. Often advocates are attacked by opponents for defending farming and food production. Words must be carefully chosen so as not to raise the feathers of those looking for any reason to object to methods of agricultural practices and animal husbandry. Farmers are often unable to find even the time to advocate for or defend their chosen profession, not to mention attending important forums such as this one. Time and money are the limitations of most agricultural pursuits, that and the weather. Farmers have limited hours to do their important work. They also have limited financial resources. Many are swimming in debt and uncertain about the future, the future of their families, their land, and their profession. No one would want to live this reality. The right to farm laws in this country are bring an important peace of mind to the industry, knowing that driving a load of silage or round bales back to the farm at nine o'clock in the evening after a long day in the field is a right that farmers need to protect. Our farmers are making great strides in the efforts to improve the quality of our state's rivers and lakes. More work is needed, and Vermont, Vermont's farmers are making headway in these efforts. There is a keen desire to make the necessary changes in agricultural practices, as displayed by the many farmer watershed, watershed partnerships. 
Today, many people choose to point their finger at others to satisfy their need to find solutions to the world's problems. This is easy to do with social media platforms giving instantaneous recognition to opinions, many times false or misleading. The ease of legal revenge is at the fingertips of anyone looking to call an attorney. Farmers and just about all citizens are constantly looking over their shoulders, wondering whether, what, or wondering, wondering what, what perceived misstep will lead to a lawsuit. Every decision is measured carefully against what someone else may condemn. It is a toxic world. The amended right to farm law will take the pressure off farmers as it has in the past, but now with more teeth. Farmers who by most accounts are improving their, our landscape here in Vermont will continue to make improvements. There will always be problems and setbacks. It's the nature of agriculture. But with the invaluable guidance of the NRCS, the Extension Service, and the Agency of Agriculture, they will be limited and mitigated. Vermont has always been an agricultural state, a, uh, at one point a breadbasket for New England and beyond. It's been a shiny example to the country of purity and healthy living. We need to protect this valuable asset as it has provided us with a way of life that is unique and unequaled, drawing people from around the world to bear witness to our hill farms, vast meadows, and fields filled with livestock. Needless and frivolous lawsuits brought about by disgruntled citizens used to living in a non-agricultural environment will not only rob our farmers of their valuable time, but also their hard-earned money. This amended right to farm law will lead to the protection farm families need to continue making Vermont the special state in which we live. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Appreciate the testimony. Have you been sued, Bill? Um, no. For, not, yeah, for anything, not, you know, by no. neighbors or anything? No, no. Okay. no. I've always uh, walked a tight rope. I, um, in putting in our restaurant, I, um, I gave a lot of consideration to that. It was a, a long process, but the size of it, what the impact would be for a neighbor. Um, I'm very, very cautious about how my farm looks and how my neighbors perceive it. It's, 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 a, it's a very rare and unusual property, and um, I take it very seriously. And uh, water quality issues forever have I always been aware of that. And I've taken advantage a bit here and there of uh, funding and what have you for barnyard and roof uh, water uh, management and that sort of thing. So we are a, a, chem a chemical-free uh, farm. I just got tired of paying the bill years and years ago of chemical fertilizers. So we've been or sort of organic, but we're not really um, officially organic. So makes thank, thank you, Bill. I appreciate the response. Sure. Um, thank you. Any, uh, Brian Kemp is next, and then Scott Magnum. Well, thank you, Senator Steers and Senator Starr and your respective committees for allowing us and giving us time. I'm going to be pretty quick. Um, a lot of what I wanted to say has already been said. Uh, I manage Mountain Meadows Organic Beef Farm down here in Rutland and Addison County. We, have, we are an MFO and we have upwards of 800 animals on our farm um, that we raise every year. Uh, and manage just under 3,000 acres of land. Uh, I'm also the president of the Champlain Valley Farmers Coalition, which is, is an active group of farmers among Addison, Chittenden, and Rutland counties, representing all kinds of diverse farms, uh, dairy farms, beef, uh, veggie growers, bee farmers, I mean, you name it, we have them in our group. Uh, so we're, we're, we're supporting large, small, and medium farms uh, of all sizes. And uh, I just would like to emphasize on this that um, hearing all the testimony early on from, from the lawyers and from the other groups um, certainly can appreciate the need for people to have, the citizens to have a voice. But I think these nuisance lawsuits, um, even though we've only had two in 20 years, um, there's now the opportunity for that to magnify considerably. As it's been said with all of the real estate boom, people coming in from the cities and whatever, moving in Vermont, um, I think we're at much more jeopardy of that continuing and to, as I said, be multiplied in the future. Um, it's also been said by others that the importance of the local food and the sustainability of our food systems here in Vermont we all experience the supply chains from the pandemic. We're still 
we're still experiencing them. And who knows how long this is gonna go on. Uh, Vermont farms are vital. Uh, Vermont farmers shouldn't need to be worried, as Bill says, uh, looking over our shoulders on what neighbor may come up with another a nuisance complaint. Um, fortunately, we don't experience much here. Experience it much here where we are, but I can certainly see in other parts of the state where it's much you're farming much more more close to the communities where there can be a, a potential for a lot more public scrutiny going forward. And I just think that this proposed bill just gives us a little bit better sense of security. None of us are looking to break the laws. We're, we're complying with the RAPs. Uh, we're going above and beyond. Um, in many cases, as everybody here knows, uh, farming is responsible for 90 plus percent of the phosphorus reductions in Lake Champlain. We're doing something right. And we shouldn't have to be fearful uh, that our day-to-day -day operations are, are, be, are gonna be susceptible to these nuisance lawsuits. So with that said, I wanna leave time for the other farmers. Thank you Thank very you. much. Uh, Scott Magnan hey, Brian. and Brian. Pardon me? Oh. I, I'm just thanking Brian. Oh, okay. Scott. You're welcome. Uh, Scott and then Maria Dead is on deck. Thank you. Thank you, All Brian. Right. Go ahead, Scott. Uh, thanks for having me. I have a written testimony. I'll try and get through it as quick as I can. Uh, good morning. Thanks for the opportunity to learn and evaluate with you today. I grew up on a 60 cow dairy farm in St. Albans in 1997. I bought a tractor and a manure spreader and started contracting field services, which is still a portion of my business today. Uh, in addition to crop services, we utilize our shop in St. Albans to help farmers implement precision ag technology and conservation equipment into their operation. We also own 100 acres and run at approximately another 100. I chair the FWA, Farmers Watershed Alliance, a group of mostly farmers in Franklin and Grand Isle County that work with and support farmers with water quality challenges. Uh, times have certainly changed since 1997 and even more since growing up on the farm. We're raising concerns fill most days, where in the early years, concerns and motivations were mostly focused on having enough economic success to remain in agriculture. The risks and rewards in agriculture have greatly shifted to higher risk than reward. And without proper planning and insurances, it's easy to get in a bind from a multitude of directions. It is recognized that some of the examples I'm about to give are just part of being a good neighbor and that in doing this, we have avoided actions against us without counsel. But it should be recognized that we are also trying to run a business that supports my family, our customers' families, and the, the families of those businesses that surround agriculture. Um, I'm still very much absorbing the current proposed law as well as the, the current law. Um, and still trying to make up my own mind about this discussion. And it seems like the issue may go beyond legislation. Now, the first example I'll give is our sunflower fields. Uh, we grow sunflowers in St. Albans. Um, it's one of the things we do on the farm. Uh, <clears throat> well, some of the concerns don't fall under the bill uh, and some, some come as a learning curve. They underline some of the challenges faced in today's climate. I think that's it's the shift in climate of, of the way people view ag and how they interact with the farms um, that, that may be important to the discussion. So four years ago, we gained a lot of attention with our requests and we had requests to view the flowers and take pictures. So we opened up the land to the public to share the field. Uh, it, it was a great way to get people engaged in agriculture, but we, we quickly added complaints from neighbors about the dust on the road. We had a, someone question our deed. So we, had, we went to our attorney's office to make sure we were within our rights and we were. Um, we had a lot of people after the event show up uninvited following the event. So we had, a, had to work out whether they were trespassing. I'm asking to leave. There was some awkward conversations and behaviors around trying to set those boundaries. So we moved the event 
um, to a more public road with a gate so we could work on setting that boundary between um, what we thought was acceptable and not acceptable. Um, <clears throat> we've had, we have, we do it by donation and we have some people that still don't go through the donation tent. They duck the gate. It's just kind of awkward human behavior that we have to manage and deal with and work through, um, which can be frustrating. Um, We've had a lot of questions on how we how we grow the sunflowers, what we use as far as treated seeds, chemicals. We've had a, some people with the perception that, oh, it's this wonderful sunflower field compared to the, the polluting corn that everyone grows. But the reality is there's, there's not much difference between sunflowers and corn and how those are managed and both can be harmful if, if managed incorrectly. So <clears throat> we have to educate and and go through that, but the perception is definitely there that, um, that there's people have perceptions, so that can create um, conflicts with people and opportunity. You have to go through the process of going through this, which is extremely can be take a lot of time. And we're just trying to run a business. So with all these um, moving pieces, we've we've actually cut our production down from 40 acres to 15, even though that market's strong. It's just the challenges can be too too time consuming to have to manage a larger on a larger scale. Um, so we still provide about services for about 15 farms through a custom operation that includes manure spreading, mowing, and round baling. Concerns are evaluated daily. Some range from timing busy traffic times to move equipment, how past rain events will impact mud going into the road, the width of equipment. Uh, we have to plan our moving routes. Um, times for field practices must be considered when there's a desire to have tractors operating your houses. So we have to shut down past daylight hours often. Uh, moving manure at any time can lead to phone calls, even when just transferring it. Um, it just raises a red flag for some people. It's a perception. Uh, family events and neighbors often postpone scheduling cropping needs. If there's a neighbor that has a a birthday for their son, we may not be able to get, get in and get that work done until, until that's over. Um, the RIPs are always at the forefront of planning. With all these, all these examples are an effort to be safe, safe, courteous, and in compliance with state law. Uh, but when compounded and then compounded with the, with the economic needs of the farm, it comes at a great expense and an increasing amount of, of risk. Uh, so more machinery is often needed to work around tight and short windows of opportunity, which in itself can be unpopular, even though it was often an outcome of circumstance. So you're, you're making all these changes to make everybody happy and at your own, at your own expense. <clears throat> um, working to please everyone has somehow kept me in business and often lands me in meetings like these, but it often comes with personal sacrifice and negative consequence. I have a stubborn desire to remain true to my roots and keep agriculture in my hands while the memories I enjoyed as a kid working with my dad are fading with today's challenges and the original obstacle of remaining motivated to still be profitable in today's environment. Having a form of government protection to ease some of these risks and pressures could be helpful and provide some relief to perform tasks needed to stay within farm budgets to get work done and hopefully decrease the general feeling of despair evident on many farms. Most obvious, this could curb expenses when unfounded actions are taken against the farm. There's certainly a lot of law in place to protect public interest, but little in place to protect the people who produce the food that feeds them. Thank you. We both had ourselves muted. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Maria Adet is next, and then um, we have Meg Nelson. A sound check. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Very Perfect. loud and clear. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, uh, my name is Maria Adet. I'm a member of Blue Spruce Farm and Adet's Cow Power. We're located on 22A in Bridport. If you ever drive 22A, we're the big green farm with a wind turbine. So that's an easy way to, to know who we are. Um, I... I over the last couple of decades, we have hosted thousands and thousands of folks on our farms. Certainly COVID through all that 
into a loop. We no longer can host tours. So about a year ago, I put pen to paper so that I could continue communicating, just like all the other farmers are saying, you know, we have such a big job in continuing to communicate with our neighbors. It's, a, it's something that we appreciate and we try to do. You know, COVID-19 really did affect every aspect of our lives. And, you know, we were suffering on so many levels and the uncertainty of what was lying ahead has taken a toll and did take a toll. But, you know, we're hopeful, um, you know, again, that the summer will bring back a sense of normalcy and certainly a renewed energy for another fight. And, you know, the, the fight against climate change. And I promise you, this is only five minutes and it will be wrapped up for you at the end and it'll make sense, I hope. Um, a blue spruce farm. Well, let me just set first, you know, we have 4,000 acres um, and about 1,500 cows, milking cows registered uh, and also young stock, 1,500 young stock. And we're adapting to the immediate impacts of COVID-19, but we're doing it while remaining steadfast and creating a future with cleaner water, healthier soil, and cleaner air. It's time for us collectively to reverse climate change with the same urgency that we've been approaching defeating COVID-19. We're doing our part through regenerative agricultural practices to save and improve our soils and sequester carbon, drawing down carbon dioxide from the air. Soil, it's all about soil and it's what gives us life. All of the food that we eat, 95% is from soil. Healthy soils acts like a sponge and it soaks up and holds on to water and it sequesters carbon. Organic matter has a great influence on soil properties and structure and it's measurable and it serves as an indicator in improving soil health. Every 1% of increase in organic matter can result in up to 20,000 gallons of available water stored per acre. That means with the predicted increases in extreme flooding, our soils will hold more water and prevent it from flooding and washing away. In years with droughts like 2020, this same organic matter preserves the precious soil moisture and it made it available to our crops. In contrast, if our cropland were developed into urban use, we would have four times as much potential phosphorus runoff. And that's according to the Lake Champlain Basin Program. Dairy farming is evolving with the science. Driving innovation and implementation of new gentler equipment and regenerative practices. The greatest investments in the last decade have been in the adaption of these evolving practices. We're sowing our crops with minimal tillage while the plows have been gathering dust for more than a decade. Our new planters now push seeds down into the soil without disturbing the soil structure, the organic matter and the soil bi biology. Our cow manure goes through an anaerobic digester where the methane is captured and generated for renewable electricity for our community. The plant fibers from the manure are separated and used as fluffy bedding for our animals. The liquid, that digested liquid, goes into a dissolved flotation system that separates 70 to 70% of the phosphorus, allowing us to use that phosphorus precisely where it is needed on our fields. The crops that were grown to feed the cows go on to make renewable electricity and then get recycled back to the soil, closing the loop. Vermont farmers are leading the nation in adopting conservation practices between 2012 and 2017, we increased our acres of no-till land by 173%, the biggest increase in the United States, and that's according to the 2017 U.S. Census of Agriculture. We ranked in the top seven states in the country for our over 100% increase in adoption of cover crops. So that means that over, well over a third of Vermont's cornfields have cover crops planted in the fall. In contrast, U.S. average is only about 5%. So farmers are quietly and often without recognition drawing carbon down from our atmosphere through our cover crops and rebuilding healthy soil. Yet, there's more to this story than sequestering carbon and protecting our soil in the face of climate change. Dairy farmers are on track to continue to provide affordable, safe, and nutritious food. It's flavorful, it's packed with vital nutrients, and it provides up to 19% of the natural protein in our diets. The dairy industry has collectively pledged to become carbon neutral or better by 2050. And that work is well on its way. Our farm is a host site 
for a rigorous study that recently started in Addison County. Dr. Joshua Faulkner, who is a research assistant professor and farming and climate change program coordinator for UVM Extension Center with a sustainable agriculture, described in this research as one of the first in the country that will study the direct links between soil health, water quality, and greenhouse gas emissions. On our farm, we're raising our fourth generation of humans, a total of 21 family members and still growing new babies, which provides all the motivation we need to care for our land, care for our animals, and preserve our farm for future generations. And participating in the study of this magnitude, for example, that test these new practices we're all talking about and the technology right here where we all live in Vermont to help us get to the future that we all want. We wanna be your partners for a healthier planet for all of our children. We are at a critical point because we are losing more and more Vermont dairy farms every year. USDA data shows that since 87, 1987, Vermont has lost 32% of its cropland. Food Solutions New England's vision states that we must build capacity to produce at least 50% of our food by 2060. As a region, New England currently produces only half of its own dairy. That's according to USDA data. We cannot afford to stay on this downward trajectory, I hope. If we do, we'll lose our potential to have local food and to manage our land to mitigate the negative impacts of climate change. The solution to the challenges of climate change like flooding and extreme temperatures from carbon emissions is right under our feet. It lies in our collective decision to support our farmers in our revolution to build this healthy soil. And I hope that you will all support us as we work hard to protect our resources, our land, air, and water, while we protect nutritious food, local for our region. I really appreciate you asking us farmers to participate today. This is a new crowd for me, and I wanna thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you very much, um, Marie. Our next witness, are there any questions for Marie? Thank you, Marie. Uh, Meg Nelson, and then followed by um, Dave Lane. Hi, everyone. Meg? Thank you. For me. Good morning. Yes. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yes. yes, we can. Okay. So my name is Meg Nelson, and I live in the Northeast Kingdom with my husband, and we both are part of our family's dairies. I work on a small dairy with my parents, and we're diversifying with cheese, and we're starting to get into some agritourism. And my husband is on a large farm in Derby in Irisburg, and they are um, putting in renovations and starting um, to build a massive rotary, which is really exciting. So we're, we're here and we plan on staying in Vermont, even though um, we sometimes get the feeling that we're not as welcome. But what uh, this bill is doing is it's really trying to pr protect farmers from these nuisance suits. And it is long overdue that Vermont needs to um, come up to speed and come up to date with the rest of the nation. Um, for farms in Vermont are so much part of the community. Uh, out West, when I, I'm in school, we'd go out West and tour farms and they were in the middle of nowhere. Just these big dairies and they, they didn't have neighbors that they'd have to worry about these nuisance suits, but they're still protected like in Ohio. Um, but because we're such part of the community, we, really feel like we are a huge part of why those communities are beautiful. Our open fields, the access to recreation like cross country skiing and um, the vast trail system, hiking, bird watching, all of that takes place on some of our land in Crassberry. And we wanna, we wanna protect that because we want our community members to continue using it. We, we enjoy sharing that with people, but at what cost if, if we're going to be subject to a nuisance suit, um, that's, that's a liability for us that we can't um, ensure and protect ourselves. So it would, uh, it would be really, really great if we could get this um, to move through. The other just point that I want to talk about, because you've all heard really wonderful testimony on what's happening with climate change and how farmers are being really proactive and a big part of the solution, 
was the COVID wake up call. Um, two years ago when COVID hit, we really saw what where our supply chains um, come and how interrupted they can be and how detrimental that can be to our small communities so quickly. And we noticed a lot of uh, folks really trying to source local things like uh, meat and milk, eggs, vegetables. And in order to do that, we have to protect our farmers so that we can protect our local supply chain. Uh, we're, we're still haven't straightened out the supply chain. Um, Vermont in particular has uh, some big, big stuff going on with milk and our, our, uh, our where we ship our milk and such. So it's um, it's something that we just we want to maintain good standing in our communities and with the state so that we can keep providing good wholesome food for our neighbors. Um, one other thing that COVID brought along was a rise in housing pressure and increased land cost. Um, just in Crassbury alone, where my family is, we had. Um, a lot of our neighbors cash in on their land and their homes and they sold for way at least twice of what they were um, appraised for and some of them even went into bidding wars. Because of that uh, we are seeing new neighbors from other states which of course we don't mind but sometimes there's a educational curve on why a chopper is going by um, and might have a a right of way on their driveway or, or things like that. Um, smells, obviously, animals going, um, using laneways to go to pasture and, and things like that that were foreign to some folks. So we, uh, we don't wanna open ourselves up to nuisance suits by doing what we've always done with uh, our new neighbors. So, and then again, I just, really want to drive home that agritourism is some is a way right now that we see um, a positive, um, I guess, excursion in order to keep our business afloat. And it's hard to want to open ourselves up completely to bringing folks onto the farm and then um, maybe having um, the liability of a, a suit or, or legal fees. Um, that example, that, that could be really real, that eight to $12,000 a week for a lawyer, that's that's just not, not in the cash flow. So thank you for your time. And I wanna make sure every other uh, person here can have their few minutes, but if you have any questions, I'm here. And thank you again for having me. Thank you, Meg. I did, just to mention, I, last year we did pass an agritourism bill. Um, that I, I thought you testified on it, but maybe I'm a different Nelson. Could have been a different Nelson. There's a few. Yeah, yeah. quite a few Nelsons around. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you, Meg. Yeah. Uh, David Lane is next, and then that will be followed by Lisa McDonough. Uh, thank you, Senator Sears. Uh, Excuse Senator me, Lisa Sorry. McDougal. I'm sorry, Lucy. Lisa, God, put my glasses on. David, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Senator Sears, Senator Starr, and committee members. Um, you have my written testimony. I'm going to just bullet a couple things. Um, so I'm with uh, Dave Lane with Farm Credit East, um, which Yankee Farm Credit, which is on uh, the list. Uh, we Yankee Farm Credit merged with Farm Credit East on January 1st. Uh, Farm Credit East is a cooperative. It's a farmer cooperative. So our customers, our farmers own us as a financial institution. We cover all of New England, New York, and New Jersey. Um, the first bullet I'm going to talk about is, is really stability, stability for businesses so that businesses can make the investment that uh, Maria Adet was, was talking about. Um, the water quality, the, the climate uh, smart agriculture um, investments. Um, Farm Credit East has uh, five, 600 million uh, invested through financing um, agriculture in Vermont. Um, and the state of Vermont also has an, several millions of dollars that they've invested in water quality and in economic development for agriculture and protecting that through stability that 
that this bill can uh, provide is important. Um, also, as um, has already been mentioned, the, the changing of agriculture has been dramatic. Uh, in addition to farm credit east, um, my family and I own Snow Farm Vineyard in South Hero. We were a former dairy farm where I grew up. Um, and we, we have thousands of people come to, the, to our farm, our vineyard winery um, every year. And that's very, very different for our community. We have a great community, but as um, uh, Mrs. Nelson just mentioned, we have a lot of new neighbors that have come in in the last few years and it's always changing. Um, and then finally, um, food security, I think is an important thing um, as well as our natural landscape that the, the farmers um, work and conserve and keep open. So I think this is very important legislation. I think the time is right with everything that's been happening and all the changes. Um, so um, I'm gonna yield my time to make sure that um, as always, we can be successful in getting the, uh, the last two uh, to testify. Thank you, David. Uh, Lisa McDougall, followed by um, George Foster. Lisa, welcome. Thank you. Um, good morning. Um, my name is Lisa McDougall, and I'm an organic vegetable farmer in Shaftesbury, Vermont, and current president of the Vermont Vegetable and Berry Growers Association. The VVBGA is a nonprofit organization founded in 1976 to promote the economic, environmental, and social sustainability of vegetable and berry farming in Vermont. Our membership includes over 425 vegetable and berry farms across Vermont and beyond, as well as 50 businesses and organizations that provide products and services to all of our members. I personally grow 15 acres of vegetables each year and sell to local farmers markets, restaurants, groceries, and have a year-round CSA. 2022 will be my 16th year in operation. On my farm, we follow a nutrient management program, adhere to compost and manure spreading bans, practice conservation tillage and no-till methods, and water test an annually to ensure our irrigation water is in good condition. We comply with required agriculture practices and also follow a food safety plan food safety plan and FSMA. These are just a few of the many practices we employ to ensure a healthy farm environment for our crops and neighbors. All of my food is sold within 30 miles of my farm. I'm here this morning to testify on behalf of the Vermont Vegetable and Berry Growers Association in favor of the amendments being proposed to Vermont's Right to Farm Bill S268. It is not just dairy farms that are in support of S268. The bill needs updating to ensure that farmers in Vermont whose practices are following state and federal regulations have protection and are not wrongfully brought to court. This goes beyond spreading manure and running tractors in the wee hours of the morning or late at night. Vegetable farmers also face potential for neighbors to file a nuisance complaint. We run irrigation pumps when it is dry out to keep our crops alive. Pumps are loud. Do we wanna be running irrigation pumps at odd hours? No, we run pumps to produce food to feed our local community. The vast majority of vegetables grown in Vermont are feeding our neighbors. Some growers may also utilize bird cannons to, pr to protect their berry crops as well as netting. Vegetable and berry crops are very sensitive and require constant attention to produce a marketable crop. The Vermont Vegetable and Berry Growers Association feels the current right to farm bill is inadequate for protecting our farmers. Now is the time to update and modify the bill so only cases that are truly considered to be a nuisance are brought to court, saving farmers time and money. Farms are disappearing in our state and need protection from urbanization. Under climate change predictions, Vermont's farms will be crucial to the sustainability of our local food systems. Every farm in this state is valuable to our local economy, producing food and employing local people and keeping Vermont's farm beautiful landscape. It is our best intent to make 
proactive updates to this bill. S268 pre presumes the farmer is innocent as opposed to assuming it is guilty. Farmers have many regulations to comply with and those in good standing deserve protection. Supporting S268 is supporting Vermont farmers, dairy farmers, vegetable farmers, Christmas tree farmers, berry farmers, apple growers, the Vermont Vegetable and Berry Growers Association hopes you will join us in support of S268. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Lisa. Thank um, you. Any questions for Lisa? All right. Um, George Foster is next. How many more do we have, Dick? George is the final and looks like we're going to make it. That's before great. we have to adjourn for the floor. But I don't see George on line here. Maybe Jackie Folsom wants to get back some of her time if she's still with us. George with us? I don't see him. Oh, well, we can hear from Jackie then. <laughs> Jackie, you get the final word for about three minutes. If we can do that, we can wrap this up and get to the floor. Thank you, Senator Sears and Senator Starr and committee. Um, yeah, so I'll do wrap up here, just like we're doing a baseball game. Thank you very much for listening to everyone today. Um, one of the things that I, that I really like when we have farmers speak is that you get to listen from the farmers to their stories. And I know that in the Senate Ag Committee, they understand the powerfulness of this. And I'm hoping that this, the Senate Judiciary, from being in front of you with the um, broadband bill, you recognize the power of the farmer stories also. Um, Vermont Farm Bureau is a policy-based program, and so um, I have to work within my policy book, but we will work to strengthen Vermont's right to farm laws to protect farmers and farmland whose use has been modified and yet still stays within Vermont's definition of farming. I think you've heard a lot of questions today about um, some of the what may be unintended consequences offered uh, in, in the current uh, S-268. But I think more importantly, I think you've heard that farming is changing. And this is not just about dairy. This is about all the types of agriculture in Vermont that feed our folks and keep our open lands um, working and take care of the land. So um, Farm Bureau, whoops, I lost my notes here. Uh, Farm Bureau looks forward to continuing the conversation on S-268 and to make sure that if we do make the changes that are proposed, they work for the benefit of the farmers as well as the neighbors and the people that are moving in so that we all have a vibrant and, um, and uh, resilient agricultural economy. Thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate it today. Thank you, Jackie. It seems like I'm seeing you every day this, this week. <laughs> Is that a bad thing, Senator? I don't no, know. <laughs> no, not at all, but you know, we've had a lot of bills in common. Um, <laughs> We do. Uh, Senator Starr, did you want to wrap up? Yeah, I'd just uh, like to thank the uh, many witnesses that uh, we had today. Um, you know, I think uh, I think their stories uh, were very uh, telling, and uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully, we can work out any differences we may have and and move this bill uh, forward uh, if we possibly can. So, and I want to thank the Judiciary Committee and Senator Sears for doing a, a co-meeting. Uh, thank you, Senator Starr. Um, we will appreciate the opportunity to meet with the Agriculture Committee and uh, to hear from the variety of witnesses we heard from this morning. I thank all of you. For your participation. Um, we will uh, take a look at this bill next week, uh, depending upon the availability of Mr. O'Grady to help us understand some of the issues. But again, my, my appreciation to all the witnesses and to the committee members uh, as well, and to Peggy Delaney for yeah. putting up with all this and setting all this up. This is a few yeah. more witnesses than we normally have, right? And Linda Lehman. And Linda Lehner. Thank you. Yeah. All right.